Hello, I'm Doreen Ellen Beldotan in Svatan, Israel. I should like herein to respond to Obeising Polly's most recent video, uh, Is This Torture? Uh, if you have not already seen that video, I assume that many of you have because she's very popular and probably the same people that listen to some of my stuff listen to hers too. But if you haven't, please look at her video. At the very least, um, the parts in which she shows the sheets um, that describe methods of torture. Uh, and she makes a very, as usual for Polly, rational, reasonable, intelligent, acceptable case for that interpretation of reality. And many agreed with her. Um, you'll see comments um, under the video that says, you nailed it, Polly. And um, when I originally didn't see the video, I just saw references to it on Twitter. And I saw the sheet on which she shows the different methods that are used for torture. And when I saw that, um, I began to reel. And my heart sunk because for the very same reasons that Polly and the people who agree with her think that what's happening now is torture. Those who have sought and found God have followed this exact path to, to God that, that, that led up to ecstatic union. Um, so I would request that if you haven't seen that video, please at least take a look at the portion of it in which she um, shows the, the points uh, which she discusses. I should also request that you watch um, two more videos in order to understand what I'm going to be discussing herein, um, either before I, can, I continue my discussion or after as you wish. Um, it's Mind Creates Reality by a, a wonderful Buddhist monk who I won't even try to pronounce his name. And another is um, a video that I came across serendipitously by someone whom I don't know. I don't even know what his name is. Um, I don't know any of his work. But this particular discussion just is absolutely on target. It's called Stop Saying I Want and Start Saying I Have the Law of Attraction. Now, I've seen a popularization of the Law of Attraction that can get a little bit, um, you know, part of the American spectacle kind of thing. Um, that's not where he is. He understands how things work, what he calls the system, and it actually is the system, very, very well. Um, my experience is, is virtually identical with his, uh, as described in that discussion. And um, I should request that you take a look at that. Um, the other two links that I have below are um, just for your pure enjoyment. Um, they're uh, poems by uh, Hafiz, uh, the very famous Sufi uh, mystic. By the way, Hafiz, uh, to this day, is either one of the or the most uh, popular poet uh, still read after all these centuries uh, in Iran. So anytime you hear terrible things about Iran, just to remember um, Rumi and uh, Hafiz and um, let their, their merit stand for their people. 
Um, as I said at the beginning of this uh, introductory discussion, Polly's analysis is a rational, rational, reasonable, documentable, um, intelligent analysis of what is happening in the world. But with God's help, I should like to proffer another interpretation of exactly the same, um, the same experiences we're having and interpret them differently such that we go from it being torture to being ecstasy. There are three terms in Hebrew that are very closely aligned. One is yagon, which I guess should be translated more or less as misery. Another is um, Inui, which is torture. I think, again, you see the, the ayin and, and the nun. And lastly, we have the word Inug, which again has the ayin and the nun, and this time with a gimel. Inug means a very, very, very high level of pleasure. Interestingly enough, the Edaman in English for Yagon and Inui and Inug together becomes agony. Yeah? So it becomes all negative, but where in, whereas in Hebrew, the Yagon and the misery and the Inui, the torture, is also create, connected to Ha'inug, uh, which is the highest level of pleasure. And this is all a matter of an interpretation. In my videos, I've been adjuring people to please understand that reality exists on a continuum. And God simply self-reveals. What happens after that, when, when that self-revelation touches our consciousness depends upon us. In relation to God, human consciousness is feminine, whether you are male or female, that doesn't matter. Moda'ut, awareness, chokhmah, wisdom, bina, understanding, dat, knowledge, are all feminine. The Hebrew, and I'll, I'll show these substitution values below, Bezrat Hashem with God's help. The Hebrew term Ein Sof, which means without end, is also equal in value to the an expression which would be Kirutzonech Ishti as you wish, my wife. In other words, God's relationship to the field of consciousness is God plants the seed. How that seed becomes a conceptualization and in what kind of a womb it grows is dependent upon our interpretation of the information that was in that seed, such that it might be yagon, misery, or it might be inug, which is pleasure. It might be inui, which is torture, or it might be haone, the one who answers. And that is equal to call, which is voice, God's voice. Herein, with God's help, I'm going to reveal something that, um, to the best of my knowledge, hasn't been revealed before, and I think that the times in, in which we are 
not only allow for it, but demand it such that we experience what's happening correctly. God's name of four letters with the most common punctuation. That is Yud, Shavana, He, Cholam, Vav, Kumatz, He is equal to 2,131. And that is equal to 1,000, excuse me, 133. So 2,131 is the same as 133. That is the value of the word Hamagifa, which means the epidemic. That word Magifa, meaning epidemic, has not coincidentally, appeared in the last two Torah portions for the week. The last two por Torah portions for the week were first of all Korach and then Balak. In both of those, um, in both of those uh, chapters, the weekly chapter, the word Megefa appears. Again, Hamagifa is 133, which is God's name with the punctuation. So whether we are experiencing a worldwide pandemic, or whether we are experiencing a worldwide revelation of God's most holy name, depends entirely upon us. God is self-revealing. How we interpret that is up to us. In my last discussion, I um, mentioned a, a young woman who describes her experience when she was in a coma. And she says how she was vaguely aware of what was going on, but in her coma, she turned what she was hearing into all kinds of different images. This is exactly what the mind does. Whether or not it turns it into beautiful images or into ugly images is purely a matter of choice. There are two words in Hebrew that are anagrams of one another. One is meta, which is dead in the female singular, and the other is tama, which means perfect in the, in the female singular. Same exact letters in a slightly different order. And I will share with you an experience that I had um, quite a number of years ago, maybe 25 years ago. I had been learning the substitution values for quite some time and had learned them well enough to be able to do them with some proficiency. And suddenly I heard from within me, at meta, you are dead. What was also being said to me, and thank God I was able to understand it, was at tama. Tama means both innocent and completed and perfect. I then found myself in what is very much like the classical description of hell. 
and I knew instinctively that I had to, that I was in a place that was eternal. And it all depended upon me how I was going to interpret that experience. One of the lessons that I had already learned was that the letter Aleph in Hebrew being one and one thousand is also equal to the word Elitz, which is a very, very, very high level of joy. The word Ish, meaning fire, begins with the letter Aleph. So I was able to understand that the eternal fire that is talked about in being in hell could be understood as elitz, which is the highest level of joy. And the letter Sheen, which is also in Esh, in fire, has all kinds of, of wonderful substitution values as well. One of them is Kapeir which is a tone to a tone. One is masar, which is to give over. One of them is yatsar, which is to create. And so I understood that the eternal flame of hell could be understood as the eternal creation of elitz, as the eternal creation of joy, and that that is the highest level of atonement. And as I was doing these substitution values, I saw myself moving up through the continuum of alternative realities from the pit of hell to the heights of heaven. And I understood that they were one and the same. Hamagefa, the pandemic that we are experiencing now, is actually the self-revelation of God's holiest name, punctuated, that means pronounced. You are living within God's holiest name being pronounced. How you're interpreting that is all up to you. Going back to Polly's um, description of what torture is, um, let's talk about uh, isolation and self-isolation. How do mystics begin their journey? Historically, in every tradition, they had to self-isolate. In, in being removed from the hurly-burly of everyday life, they were then able to turn within and find God and understand that they were, they were anything but alone. But they had to turn off the outside noise. Some traditions, like the Catholics and like the Buddhists, have cloisters. People go there to find God. Jews don't have cloisters. We do have a full immersion learning experience before we get married. Once we're married, then we have to be in the outside world. Hashem doesn't want us to be sequestered. But many of us in, in an Orthodox tradition, and I, I give great thanks to, to my teachers from Chabad who gave me this experience, 
uh, years ago uh, in Minnesota. We go to seminars before we're married for total immersion in learning. Subsequently, I disagree with many of the things that I learned there, but that was the beginning of my journey and I could not have gone to, gotten to where I am now without those basic teachings, some of which I had to accept, some of which I was not able to and had to um, reinterpret. But I had that full immersion of learning. I had also gone to university. I, I went to the Chabad Learning Center after I finished university. So I had had four years of full immersion learning and now I had 12 weeks of, it was absolute joy. <laughs> We showed up at what had been the um, Schaefer Brewing Company, uh, the, the Bronfman, I think, family owned this once, and, and Chabad had bought the mansion from that family and opened it up as a, as, as a, as, as a school. We would wake up, I don't know, 7 o'clock in the morning and say morning prayers and then we would have breakfast and then we would learn straight through until lunch. We would take a lunch break and we would come back to learning. We would learn straight through until dinner. And, and then, of course, they were afternoon and evening prayers. And then returning from, from prayers and dinner, we would learn until, I don't know, one or two o'clock in the morning. And again, wake up at seven o'clock in the morning and start it again. It was ecstasy. It, when I say full immersion, what does full immersion mean to Jews? Full immersion means going into the mikveh. It means being what you call baptized. You go into the waters of God and you just stay there. You just stay there and you learn how to breathe under, the, un, under God's oceans. And it is, it is absolutely magnificent. And Hashem has given the whole world the opportunity to, to experience that. And when I heard somebody referring to that as torture, it broke my heart because self-isolation has always been to the purpose of, of, of coming to higher consciousness. Whether or not we take what's happening to us as sweetness and the revelation of God depends upon who you think is really running this world, not who you're giving lip service to, but who you think is really running the world. If you think these things are being are being imposed upon you by Bill Gates, of course it's going to be a horror. But if you understand that this it's it's God and, and, and look into what's happening and try to see what God is saying to us in the midst of it, then the experience becomes very different. Let's take the word masicha, which means mask. Masicha in Hebrew is equal to 125, which happens to be the word tzahel, which is the verb, the root verb to, to rejoice ecstatically. So hamasicha, the mask, would be tzahala, that is the, the noun of ecstatic joy, tzahala. That is where the word hail, which you call hell, comes from, that, that, that light of, of, of sheer ecstatic joy. You call it Lucifer. We call it Sahala. We call it joy. It's a beautiful breeze. Um, I'd also like to, one of the things that, that, that Polly uh, talked about was also a, a, a restriction of, of, of food, of, of, of minimizing the diet. And to that purpose, I'd like to turn off the video for a second and take you on a little tour. Okay, Let's hold on.
Okay. As you can see, we live in very modest <laughs> quarters. This is my kitchen. For people like us, on our modest, there are my pistachios, my organic pistachios hiding back there. <laughs> there they are. This is abundance that borders on the miraculous. My organic cane sugar is back there. <laughs> Look at this. Look at this bounty. Look at this. These are my uh, spelts and uh, carob cookies that are also organic. And all of this is, is health food. Why am I showing you all this? I'm showing you this because veganism, it's stuffed. Uh, my major problem making Shabbat was having, like, making room in the refrigerator for what we had. <laughs> what we have. Okay. These are my, um, I've been keeping myself busy doing things I've never done. I'm making essences. This is from 88%. Uh, Peruvian organic chocolate and this is my vanilla essence and my orange and my lime and my mint and I've just been having a ball trying to make um, trying to make yogurt um, sit down a minute and continue the the video veganism is is very often our first introduction into holy materialism. A, a materialism that is the answer to gross materialism and to uh, piggish materialism. The answer to gross materialism is not spirituality. I've spoken about that any number of times. We're not supposed to be spiritual beings. We're supposed to be living in the phenomenal world and enjoying it ecstatically. But in order to be able to do that without any guilt, we have to do that morally. So if in our enjoying there is some kind of moral taint, our enjoyment has to be restricted. Has to, you can't eat too many calories, you can't eat too much ice cream, um, and so forth and so on. When we are engaging in materialism that is holy, that doesn't involve any kind of pain, we can enjoy it fully, <laughs> like the breezes. Um, so for breakfast, vegans typically eat a, a pint or three quarters of a a quart or even a quart of uh, nice cream uh, without any kind of uh, either moral uh, pangs or any kind of physical pangs that actually does the body good. Um, so abundance, holy abundance comes when we relate to the physical world not with denial, not with asceticism, but with enjoying it fully in holiness. Veganism is considered a restrictive diet, restricted food. Well, you see, first of all, the amount is certainly not restricted. What is it restricted of? It's cruelty restricted. I took upon myself not to allow myself to enjoy the fruits of another's suffering. And so it's restricted, yes, but in return for restricting myself from the questionable pleasure of, of enjoying another sentient being's misery, I decided to eat vegan. And the misery was turned into inug, 
the, the misery was turned into joy, both for the animals that aren't being killed because of me and for me. And so what happened was that which was restricted became super abundance. We've never had that much food in this humble house, these humble means, in those kinds of amounts. So everything that Hashem is making us experience now is to the purpose of bringing about worldwide, worldwide acceleration and and um, ascent. ascent, ascension. Thank you. A world. Thank you, Abba. <laughs> worldwide ascent. That's what this is all about. This is not to make you miserable. You know, I was thinking about people balking at, at uh, wearing uh, masks. Admittedly, it's a little bit annoying. But um, I think that there's a, that people are, are making it out to be much more than it is. Um, I think that, that Hashem is trying to tell us something about the masks that we wear. I think that Hashem is trying to teach us a lesson about masks, both when Hashem wears a mask and presents itself to us in all kinds of different forms, some of which are pleasant and some of which are not, to be able to recognize Hashem behind whatever mask Hashem wears, and also to teach us about the masks that we put on. I have a feeling that some of the people that um, balk at wearing masks, don't like the fact that it smears their lipstick and, and might make their foundation rub off. You get me? Um, so there's a lot of lessons to be learned um, in, in wearing masks and rather than asking ourselves why is Bill Gates doing this to me? The answer of which, of course, is going to be demoralizing and infuriating. The question should be, why is Hashem taking on the, the trappings of this experience? What am I supposed to learn? What are we learning together? What are we learning individually? And what are we learning together? There's a, a brilliant psychologist in Israel by the name of Miriam Adahan. I think I've mentioned her in some of my videos. In one of her books, I think it's, it's all a gift. She talks about mental map making. And she talks about how we are in full control of the aperture in our consciousness. We decide the topography of our mental and emotional landscapes. So we decide what to shrinky-dink down to the level of what she calls is pin, uh, Gardner Pinnacles, which I never heard of until I read her book. Uh, the, the meaning being some little teeny tiny place that's so small that very few of us have ever heard of it. Or to expand something to the size of China. We do that in our minds. We are in control of our mental, emotional map making. And how we think about things will determine whether or not we experience what we're going through now as our all having been immersed in, in a Buddhist monastery to the point of, of, of reaching levels of consciousness worldwide that we never could have imagined would happen on a large scale and to understand that as as the epidemic that's going on or uh, to 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 think that it's it's Bill uh, Gates that's in touch uh, that's in uh, control of all of this and then of course you're going to be miserable and frightened and feel helpless and so forth and so on but uh, know that, that those who are thinking that way are only torturing themselves. Thank you for listening.